after Michael Manley was no longer the Prime Minister. And so I said, yes, my dear, I will deliver it to the Prime Minister. But that indicates to me what he represents. Michael Manley dared to look horizontally instead of being dependent vertically. So that we are grateful to him, if nothing else, to force the Caribbean to look horizontally and free itself from vertical dependence. Mr. McEnany. Brother Chairman, Mrs. Vera Rubin, other distinguished participants, and my brothers and sisters. I began my, my participation in this conference with something of a shock. I entered the room as my friend Archie Singham was speaking. In fact, he was in full flight. <laughs> but that, of course, was not the occasion of my shock. <laughs> he was in the middle of his dissertation on the nature of war and the relationship between war and the Caribbean. And I actually heard him saying my advice to all Caribbean political figures, return home and study war. <laughs> I had just entered the room at that moment. <laughs> Apart from the fact that I realized immediately that I was misplaced. <laughs> Let me hasten to assure you, Archie, that I actually took the plane this morning. And I'm returning on the first flight tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I will take the rest of your comments to heart. The the second comment that I, I would like to be permitted, if I may, is to endorse Ricky Singh's suggestion of George Lamming as a chairman of Caribbean people. I'm happy to see George here. I see George shaking his head. But I do say in all sincerity that I, I, I think it's an interesting idea and I can think of no better choice. Though I'm sure George will not thank me for that endorsement. My last comment is perhaps the serious one, or the most serious one. I was very struck with the, the clarity of J. Mandel's comment, analysis, criticism. I would not presume to either speak for or confess on behalf of anybody in Grenada or in Guyana. But I do not hesitate to say that we in our part of the Jamaican political process, even if we have not expressed the criticism as harshly, are very conscious of uh, a substantial merit in the criticism that he advances. And in fact, listening to him, I wondered if I should perhaps tear up the notes that I have and uh, speak only to the question, what have we, or what do we think we have learned from the experience of what we attempted? And perhaps I can find a way, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, to, to weave a type of rejoinder into my comments. Mark, I'm not sure how exhausted you all are. Uh, I, I, I would imagine that you're in a state of advanced exhaustion. <laughs> and your, your mere presence here is not only a great courtesy, but an extraordinary act of stamina. <laughs> and I, I will try to respect your condition. <laughs> In thinking of uh, the, the theme of this conference, 
I'm very glad that there have been such a number of distinguished scholars because it is really in the province of scholarship to rest prophecy on analysis. <laughs> and I, who am merely a working political activist, really could not trespass into the 21st century. I think I have enough problem wondering to do what to do with 1984. <laughs> but on the assumption that you have been thoroughly briefed on the perspectives that are relevant for and the, the prospects which you can accept for the 21st century, I would like, if I may, more to speak at a very practical level out of our own political experience of the question, granted that we do get to something called the 21st century, with what should we occupy ourselves between now and then? I begin naturally with all of the obvious comments. One is very conscious that speaking of the Caribbean region, that you are speaking of some 50 million people, which is a potentially viable aggregation of souls. which is a potentially viable aggregation of souls. But the Bible begin naturally with all of the obvious comments. One is very conscious that speaking of the Caribbean region, that you are speaking of some 50 million people, which is a potentially viable aggregation of souls but divided into no less than 30 countries and nation states, therein lying one of our problems. I therefore have no difficulty whatsoever, have always felt profoundly that it is impossible to conceive of ultimate viability in the Caribbean outside of the context of regional integration that I take for granted. One is interested in the fact that our region played such a profound part in the past, in the whole of that process that led to the capital accumulation that was a foundation of the Industrial Revolution. And it's very interesting. in the whole of that process that led to integration mm -hmm. that I take for granted. One is interested in the fact that our region played such a profound part in the past, 
in the whole of that process that led to the capital accumulation that was a foundation of the Industrial Revolution. And it's very interesting, in a sense, perhaps ironic, that the Caribbean region, which contributed so much to European economic development two, three centuries ago, should now once again be on the world stage, but in a different context, a strikingly different context. Because when we look at the region, I think that we can isolate perhaps three things that are immediately significant and each profoundly problematic. The first is that perhaps more than any other part of the world, the Caribbean is now the heart of that foreign exchange crisis that besets and bedevils the third world. Secondly, we are interesting in that we show a certain political creativity in the search for new political and economic forms, strategies, answers, if you will, each of which itself becomes an immediate flashpoint of international pressure, controversy, and action. And thirdly, of course, we are, I suppose, as much as any part of the world, illustrative of the problem of small countries trying to exercise sovereignty in the presence of an aggressive and pervasive hegemony. So if you look at those things as, in a sense, providing the indicators of our situation, let us see if we can proceed very quickly from the dominant realities, which are obvious, to responses that are taking place, and then to what I really would like to talk about, which is the political problem, the political response that is possible. I do so reminding you that we cannot all operate on the assumption that we work in our political, com in our particular country, in what I might call a framework of revolutionary simplicity. Most of us operate as political activists in extremely complex political environments that have flowed from complex political and social history. Nor can we base our tactics on assumptions, however justified, however idealistically desirable, of significant change in the international environment. Therefore, we face this reality that in looking at the problem of development in the region, we have to take account of enormous political complexity. It is a reality with which we must deal, and we have to take into account a given international environment which is predominantly hostile to our interests and our possibilities. In fact, it was Lucille Mayer who spoke very eloquently. Of some of the nature of that hostility. What therefore do we, do we in Jamaica, we in the People's National Party, what do we think are the realities?
forces with which we must deal. We are mostly cases of small economies. We almost all reflect that structural dependence which is the legacy of the long colonial experience. Without exception, the economies are deformed. All come to independence and are still proceeding on that path within the matrix of some form of dependent capitalism. There is therefore heavy dependence on external and unequal trade, heavy dependence on foreign capital, substantial foreign control in place. These are facts that I have no doubt have been amply reventilated at this conference. And what we see as the, you might say, the political environment in which we work is two clear trends of political activity which are present, of which we are a part, and with which we must deal. We deal with a powerful neo-colonialist reality. in which we work is two clear trends of political activity which are present, of which we are a part, and with which we must deal. We deal with a powerful neo-colonialist reality. That is the first trend. It is a reality that is comprised of the traditional oligarchies, the multinational corporations, very often the army, and very often those elements of what we can describe as popular groups, the masses sometimes call, called, who have come from colonialism in a considerable state of dependent psychology. And associated with that are all the, the classic tactics of anti-communist propaganda and uh, the willingness to resort to military force if there is the slightest threat to the power and position of the traditional oligarchy. And it is interesting that all of the protagonists of the neo-colonialist thing, whether they live within polite Westminster-style democracies or impolite military tyrannies, all have the common agenda of asserting that only foreign capital within the context of the status quo can do this job of development, meaning by that finding the answer to foreign exchange crisis, finding the answer to unemployment, finding the answer to the development of productive capacity. To the general thesis of foreign capital is now added, of course, the Reaganomics of supply side political economy, which is now stoutly championed even by our own Prime Minister in Jamaica. Against that, we identify the possibility of a broad alliance, very incomplete in its articulation, very uneasy in its political understanding, very uncertain in its sense of tactics and strategy. And it is those forces which have an interest in or can be committed to or persuaded to the development of an independent path of development in which one is seeking firstly the assertion of sovereignty, particularly in the economic field, seeking to provide an economic foundation to political independence so that viable societies can emerge. In our own experience, and others can 
comment on this. In our own experience, we detect in Jamaica the possibility that elements in that alliance can come from a new class of entrepreneurs, sometimes called the patriotic private sector, as distinct from the traditional oligarchy of the latifundists and the major merchant traders, obviously the intellectuals and the professionals, and critically, the trade unionists, the workers, and of course, farmers or peasants, if you will, other than latifundists, what you might loosely describe as a kind of enlightened popular force. And looking at that, I would like to suggest that a first strategic principle emerges in the struggle against imperialism, and that is the importance of not confusing, not confusing the struggle against imperialism with a struggle against local private sectors per se. I think that one of the one of the strategic tragedies that can occur is when people oversimplify both the nature of our possibilities and the nature of our realities by allowing a confusion to exist between an anti-imperialist struggle and a view of the role and place of a local private sector within each national confirmation. Let us look very quickly, if we may, at what is the obvious economic and social agenda. And it is after that that I would like to comment on political strategy very much in the context of J. Mandel's criticism. Obviously, when we look at an economic agenda for each territory that can come within the political leadership, hopefully a legitimate political leadership, if I might quote Mr. Mandel, there is a very clear economic and social agenda, which I think we derive from experience. Firstly, that there has to be the tightest and most consistent control of what we might call economic aggregates, that governments who bear this responsibility have got to begin with tremendous levels of fiscal and budgetary control. Secondly, that they have to determine and develop the clearest priorities over the use of foreign exchange and the prioritization of foreign exchange. Thirdly, that there has to be, again, the clearest sense of priorities in the direction of investment to strategic economic development. Fourthly, that there has to be major investment in agriculture aimed at the greatest and most rapid possible self-sufficiency in food, because this has tremendous implications for the internal use of resources, tremendous implications for the possibility of rural transformation, and immense implications for problems of foreign exchange, and immense implications for the very fact of having an independent polity that is not unnecessarily dependent on external sources to feed itself. Fifthly, there has obviously to be a very clear and precise program that deals with social justice, because without that there is no prospect of maintaining a mass momentum in what one is doing. Sixthly, that one has to work constantly and ceaselessly to explore the practical possibilities of regional economic cooperation and integration, and a whole lecture could be developed on that alone, the practical possibilities and challenges and the difficulties that one faces with them. And then seventhly, I would add, of course, that every sinew of effort, will, and intelligence should be strained to avoid dependence on the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> political agenda. And here I would like to suggest a second strategic principle. It is one with which we were even more unfamiliar many years ago than we were in the case 
of the strategic principle about tactical alliances in the struggle against imperialism. And I would put it in this way. And that is that those who are concerned to develop a political process committed to the effective development of economic independence must avoid the populist seduction that is inherent in traditional democracy. And here I would like to pause to say very precisely and exactly what I mean. Because I think this is one of the hearts of the matter of what we think we have learned and how it relates to Mr. Mandel's strictures. I understand populism as meaning in its most favorable interpretation. The assertion by a political process of its intention to do good works left, right, and center, to do all those things that everybody would like to have happen immediately. Perhaps that's a crude oversimplification. Bear with me. For instance, to talk about universal free education before one has examined the resource demands of that, the financial implications of it, is populism. <coughs> Similarly, with universal health services, the assertion of it, the putting of it, for example, into a political platform in the absence of a clear understanding of how, why, and with what, is populism. And uh, I would suggest that there's no way that we who seek to be part of the struggle, which is your concern here, can hope to compete with the neo-colonialists in the politics of promise. <laughs> they will out promise us every time, and every time that we rest our own political process on ill-considered promise, we sow the seeds of reversal for our own process. Because when the hard realities have emerged after three years in office and the promises are not met, nor in prospect of being met, what happens is you create a convulsive rejection, psychologically and otherwise, of the kind of program to which you are committed, and immediately a receptivity to the blandishments of the neo-colonialist who says if you're only on all Ron's good side, you'll get all the goodies that you need. And uh, this path, therefore, demands, I suggest, a rigorous adherence to serious political education within the ranks of the political parties that are concerned. And I mean by political education, not merely saying that we would all like to have free education but rather a political education that examines, first of all, the nature of colonial history, the nature of the world political system and how it operates, the nature of imperialism, the nature of colonialism, of neo-colonialism, and uh, the nature of budgets and how they are constructed, of, of national finance and how it is organized. So that at the simplest levels, perhaps, one begins to develop throughout a process Cadres whose knowledge of their political environment is increasingly mature and sophisticated. Granted that this is at the heart of political work, serious political education, rather than populism or even sound political organization, which is also important. There has to be a rigorous adherence to the principles of mobilization. That is the development of the techniques for ensuring not only that people understand as best one can what are the challenges and difficulties, but have some idea of what is the part they can play in finding solutions and answers. And of course, if both political education and mobilization are to have meaning, then one has got to design institutions of participation that create genuine functioning links between party cadres, people in communities, and the 
the decision-making process at both the party level, the national level, and the community level. It is true, I suppose, to what, up to a point when Mr. Mandel says that the Caribbean is short of models. I might remind him that we are also, not in self-excuse, but that we are also a little short in historical experience. Um, his own society has been at this for a couple of centuries longer than many of ours. He's not too strong on, on participatory techniques itself, incidentally. <laughs> But I agree that he would enjoy the luxury that he's in a society that perhaps does not need to concern itself. I accept his strictures because we have no choice. <laughs> we have to learn fast, and we'd better learn fast, or we are doomed. So I'm quite clear about that. And you know, I would like to give, if I may, if, if, I, if you're not utterly exhausted by now, I'd like to give just one or two examples of the sorts of things of which one speaks, and then an example of how we are trying to go about it for what it is worth in our party, and then we can go to the awards, which I believe will bring us to a close. But very simply, if you look for example, let's take some practical issues. Let, let us come out of the scholarship for a moment and get down to the nitty gritty of what governments have to deal with. For instance, if you've got a tremendous shortage of resources at a moment in time, your taxes are at the limit of where you think you can take them, and you're short of ideal educational facilities, ideal health facilities. The sort of answer that we have got to be able to find, if we are to maintain the credibility of the process and its ability, therefore, to pursue our chosen path is you've got to be surely find ways to mobilize communities to accept a self-reliant responsibility to make contributions even to things like the maintenance of school plant, to the condition of hospitals, not as a permanent condition, but as a way of mobilizing people to bridge the gap between, on the one hand, an absolute fiscal and budgetary responsibility, which you cannot avoid, and on the other, the improvement of human facilities that are so important. And why this is critical is that your choices are either to allow the hospitals and the educational system to rot, in which case the masses will turn against you and spit you out in due course, or you will try to buy your way out of the problem by spending money that is not backed by resources, and in no time you will be in a foreign exchange crisis, and in no time you will be deep in the arms of the International Monetary Fund. So therefore, we are system to rot, in which case the masses will turn against you and spit you out in due course, <coughs> or you will try to buy your way out of the problem by spending money that is not backed by resources, and in no time you will be in a foreign exchange crisis, and in no time you will be deep in the arms of the International Monetary Fund. So therefore, realistically, you can both promote an answer and also teach a principle of communal self-reliance if you find an answer in mobilization. How often do we face the problem in Jamaica that a drive towards domestic agriculture, which is critical to the development of your human resources and the use of your land, it runs afoul of the massive resistance of the centuries of people who are accustomed to a wheat-based diet or accustomed to salt fish imported from Canada. Therefore, both in the starch and carbohydrate base of your diet and in your protein alternatives, a vast job of political education, citizen education, and therefore mobilization is a precondition of your ability to pursue an effective policy of domestic agriculture. I don't even need to talk about foreign exchange priorities, where you have the deep neocolonialist instincts of a population that lives beside Miami, lives beside the massive impact of television advertising day in and day out. You have to deal with huge unconscious assumptions about the things to which people think they're entitled. 
And they're not just middle class assumptions. They're very often working class assumptions. If you cannot therefore mobilize people to understand that the latest blandishments of Madison Avenue must be resisted not as an act of anti-Americanism, but as the price of a national economic policy that makes sense, the doing without luxuries and the prioritizing of foreign exchange. There is a huge job of national political education that has to be done. And so one could multiply the examples. And most importantly, when you talk about the regional integration movement and the importance of the development of the practical examples of common economic action, the development of incremental factors of production regionally by regional economic planning. That is the sort of thing that is delightfully the subject of scholarly rhetoric. <laughs> Nobody can spot it better than me, and I'm not even a scholar. <laughs> and yet it is one of the hardest things to do in the world. When you're trying to get 10 Caribbean islands to follow Eric Williams' injunction to start a Caribbean food corporation, one of the most imaginative practical ideas ever to emerge in modern Caribbean politics. I wonder how much one realizes the formidable type of problem that you have to meet. If you're to make it work, 10, 11 sets of civil servants have got to accept a political direction that it is important. <laughs> You've got to know that when the politicians cannot, that was, sorry, let me start again. Let me go back to the politician. You first of all have to get 11 political directorates who understand why it is important. That's where the problem begins. But let us assume that we get past that. You then deal with the bureaucracy. And you deal with the fact that if three of those bureaucracies get caught up in an IMF crisis, then the limited talent in those three political and bureaucratic directorates are now distracted to find a solution. And yet if all 11 are not working equally quickly, a solution cannot be found. So what does all this mean? It means that there has to be the clearest understanding beyond the rhetoric of politics of the question why we will fail without regional integration, what it is that regional integration really demands when it comes off the drawing board of language and onto the drawing board of reality. What is the kind of bureaucratic commitment that is needed? What is the kind of political will that has to drive it? Well, these are the problems and we have to meet them. In looking at the question of internal political processes with which I end, I can only say what we are trying to do, born of our experience in office, what we tried, and God knows we tried many things. The fact that we failed, which we cannot dispute, but let Mr. Mandel be assured the failure is a setback, not a permanent defeat. Even, even how we understand the significance of the Grenadian tragedy. What we have done is actually a continuation of what we began to do, but perhaps too late in the experiment, and that is to put what we hope is meaningful political education at the heart of our political process. That is the first, in our view, indispensable act. Secondly, in determining policy, if you will, programmatic platform, we have, uh, we now adhere to very strict participatory models, and they take the following form. Within the framework of our, our broad policy, which is set out in our basic policy documents and our definitions of democratic socialism, we have tried to look at economic strategy foreign policy strategy, foreign trade strategy, manufacturing strategy, agricultural strategy, etc. But in all of these, what we have done is to set up task forces that try to work out the most concrete programmatic proposals. Those in turn are then the subject of intensive internal discussion in our political party that ends with 
general conference discussion so that there is to the greatest possible degree an understanding of what we think we can do and an understanding by the whole of our political party of what it implies for them as members. They are then required to discuss those things in our group formations, to discuss them in their communities. We're not finished there. When we've got all those together, we are now, for instance, embarked in a program in which proposals for manufacturing development are in discussion with the trade union movement, are in discussion with private sector organizations, and the fruits of both the trade union and the private sector organizations are going to be reported back to our annual conference, which is being held in the next two weeks, so that the 2,000 delegates from all over Jamaica will not only know what they're thinking about, but what is the reaction of other elements in the community to it. Our teaching program is discussed with the teachers, unions, et cetera, et cetera. And let me illustrate, use that to illustrate the importance that we attach to trying to, to demystify programmatic platform, to make it a part of the ongoing understanding and experience of our own membership, and to make it a part of an ongoing dialogue between ourselves and the institutional disposition of the society at large. I cannot guarantee to Mr. Manza that the next government of the People's National Party, and uh, I suppose there will be one, all the indications are that there will be one, um, I cannot guarantee to him that we are going to be perfect or that we are going to represent some ID left that can now be held up as a triumphant model to the rest of the world. But we have tried to learn a lot from experience and are trying to see if we can find practical institutional answers to the problems that arise. As to him, I'm glad to hear him say that he accepts his responsibility to work for change within this political system. And I endorse what he says. It is good to know that people like him will continue to work, to try to work within this political system for recognition of pluralism, respect for sovereignty, and a containment of the worst excesses of hegemonic power. More power to your arm, Mr. Mandel. I hope also that we can address the international community when we say that those of you who run aid programs like representatives of social democracy in Europe must begin to consider cutting a drip from the present arrangement in which even aid programs for education are not given unless a country has the seal of approval of the International Monetary Fund. And one of the things that we are challenging social democracy to face is just that within the Socialist International. I would say to those who work with an interest in aid programs that we should begin to de-emphasize the exclusive emphasis on unilateral programs, mm -hmm. of which the CBI is a most unfortunate example, and emphasize more a willingness for aid to be funneled towards regional plans that are produced by regional organizations such as CARICOM and the CARICOM Secretariat. <laughs> I hope that all of you will maintain the pressure for the new international economic order because we well understand that it is hard to change Jamaica without changing the Caribbean and hard to change the Caribbean without changing the world. I hope those pressures will be maintained. But in the last analysis, Brother Chairman, the struggle is ours and ours alone. We can be helped, we can be facilitated, but the real answer lies in the development of our own mature political processes, the understanding of the strategic imperatives which are necessary, and the willingness to develop the keenest sense of tactics so that we can move forward with our agenda at all times, I think.